this is all cardiac. All like this right now. All right, so whenever y'all are ready, I'm ready. All right, you're dispatched to a 48 year old male complaining of chest pain. And when you arrive on scene, you find this male sitting on a stack of wood in obvious discomfort. Looks like you might be having a little difficulty breathing. And they set a construction site, it's hot out. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Dino Suda. I'll be with. Uh, I'll be helping you out today. I'm with uh, the Cap County Fire. Um, seems to be the problem today. Uh, having a little bit of chest pain. It just came about sudden. Hurt okay. Pretty bad. Um, have you ever had this feeling before? This pain before? No, never. Uh, um, okay. How long has it been going on? Uh, probably. 25, 30 minutes or so now. What were you doing right before the pain started happening? Uh, I was up on the second story welding, just normal, another day at work. It just kind of st started on its own? Yeah. Okay, does um, does the pain seem to um, just stay in your chest? Is it moving around anywhere else or? Kind of left arm and neck a little bit. Okay, um, what's the pain like? Is it kind of like a sharp pain or more of like a dull pain? Does it seem to like? like Crushing, crushing, kind of like yeah. the pressure on your chest. Um, um, okay, well, go ahead and relax just for a minute, sir. We're gonna um, check a few things on you and then uh, see what we can do for you. All right, push analyze. Hey, John, I'm going to put this on your finger. We're going to pull this off soon. Push, analyze. Thank you. That's fine. You don't get a little pressure on that already. Pull socks. Um, uh, 94 right now. 94. Mm -hmm. And then um, pulse locks also give us the pulse rate. Push, analyze. Things still seem to be the same, not getting any worse or any better. No. Push, analyze. It's pretty much the same as it was when it started. Mm -hmm. Your lungs sound clear. Both sides. Both sides. Both sides are clear. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll also hook you up uh, for our little monitor here. Take a, take a look at your heart. Are you on any medications? Uh, yeah, I think Claritin, Lobutrin, and Levothyroxine. Okay. Any past medical history? That's, uh, any past medical history? Uh, yeah, I got hypothyroidism. So you're going to put a little quick on your thing about the take your glucose off? All right. Your glucose is going to be at a 
When was the last time you ate? Uh, probably about an hour ago. Could you have meat, sandwich, and some apples? Any allergies? Uh, moxicillin. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think some oxygen as well, sir, might help you out. We also just want to get a picture of how your breathing is going. Not the respiratory rate, but the uh, SPO2 limit to 96. Okay. And did you guys write down CO2 levels? You just mentioned that. I'll keep this up to the machine. So. Right. Okay. Okay. Check of everything. Um, how do his pupils look? Uh, All righty. Anything else on his head of note? On his neck? Everything looks okay. Any swelling around his neck? No JVD. No JVD. Um, chest? Anything? Yes. No other pain anywhere, sir? Uh, like I said, just my left arm is going down. My neck. Okay. Um, no swelling on his legs or by his feet. No, no. Nothing at all. On his back, does anything seem to hurt or seem out of place on his back? But good. Did you like left shoulder? Where was that pain? And they said into the left shoulder. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Said it's never happened before. Did you ever miss your heart attacks, sir? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um. Go ahead and try to put your arms up above your head, sir. Does it the pain change at all? It still hurt? No, it's about the same. Same. So. Okay. Um, says it's process. Oh yeah. Um, the, oh, what's his pulse now that we diminished in the oxygen? So like one oil. Um control. Um, 
Respiration rate is at 20. His SPO2 started at 94. He's got a lot of nasal at six liters. So now he's at 96. And blood glucose is 98. Uh, thank you again, Regan Calling and and we're looking at the that is to keep the I forget, I printed it out twice. <laughs> this is normal both times. You, um, chew them up real good. All right. Don't swallow them right away. Just try to chew them and chew them real slow. Go run by. Hey, it's in a five tree. Uh, at, oh, it's in a five baby. Yeah. Start line as well. We're also going to give you some fluid. Okay, sir. Five Uh, 
Thing, all right. Um, okay, sir. 10 8 Huh? Thank you, sir. We're giving nitro. Um, let's go ahead and notify. Um, uh, dispatch, we can dispatch one of Who would want to? Go ahead, Mr. Crow. That is the patient. That's about it. That's about it. I mean, we have it in, but what do we? Yeah, that's what we were asking. He's about to go in there and tell us something. We need to get them, we need to get transport started. So having heart attack. This uh, is squad three. Yeah, right. Mention yeah. 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 Hey, Liz. 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 Sir, how are you feeling? Um, feeling pretty weak now. Getting worse than before. I got a headache now. Yeah, uh, yeah, that does tend to happen a few times. What about the pain in your chest though? It's still, still just as bad as before. Uh, Not getting any better. Okay. How's your breathing? Still okay to breathe? Uh, yeah. A little shortness of breath. Yeah. You know. What's that? All right. So what kind of suspected? Uh, just elevation. Uh, acute infarct. Intero interoceptal infarct. Interoceptal infarct. Yep. Uh, yes, same question. Are you going to do the bypass? Is it shortness? Yeah, he said shortness. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah, 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 we
How are you feeling with that uh, mask? Now, so? It's a little bit easier to breathe with that on. Okay. Uh, we're going to get a tip on you just one second. Well, David, Bob, before you have your for you, what personnel is going to make the pulse rate still elevated one out of four? Yeah, I want to check to see if there's anything else going on. How does his um, eyes and face and everything still look about the same? Mm -hmm. Skin color still about the same? Um, still a little sweaty. Still no JVD or anything like that. <clears throat> Chest and everything still looks about the same. No swelling anywhere. No pain in the abdomen or anything like that. Swelling in the legs and lower feet. Back, nothing else going on. Nothing out of place in the back. You said not there. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna get you out of here real soon, sir. We're gonna try to get you to uh, the nearest hospital. We're just trying to get some confirmation real quick. Uh, let's just reassess while we're waiting, anyways. We got time. So blood pressure one more time. Blood pressure one eighteen over nine. One eighteen over ninety again. Pulse rate. Pulse rate one hundred four. One hundred four still. Hey. Uh, SPO2? Still at 96. 96. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me know how you're feeling, sir, if anything changes. Wait on transport yeah. yet? One second. Oh, okay. I thought you asked them something. We were waiting on that. We have an update on the hospital. Is that they are not able to accept the patient once you uh, divert to another hospital? So uh, stand by on that. We still have transport with them. We'll do it there. Yeah, sure. The, the nearest one. We're being diverted to the nearest one. Yeah. No, that's not what you said. They can't accept the patient at the closest. At the closest. Right. They're going to want you to depart to a hospital that has a CAD lab that's a specialty facility. Cardiac For the nearest cath lab hospital. This was 12 3. 12 3. We have an update on the transport unit. Still feeling the same, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit weaker. All right. Yeah. What? What'd you ask? Update on transport. Or cast map. Update on transport. Because I mean, they're they're dispatched. They know that. Right. 
I think Morris just wants us to specify a uh, cath lab hospital. I think that's one of the So, hey, shut up. Stay in the hallway. Stay in the hallway. Stay Are you all familiar with the first building? Yeah, I'm See if we can give them another dose. Pain has not subsided. Let's see if we can administer another dose. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are we clear to administer another dose? Just say that, Doctor. We need the new That's why I was saying we need to ask about the closest one. Yeah, please don't be too long. That's not right. right. It's on standby, so let's find out how long it would take to get to the nearest cat lab. If it's a long time, then yeah, we could do the air. Thanks, Buffer. Sir, how are you feeling after that second dose? Uh, Come on! All right, so I got bed control coming back in. Yeah. Um, so let's start with the scenario riders. Tell us what they we encountered. They were dispatched to a construction site. 48 year old male was complaining of chest pain. Uh, when they got there, he was in obvious discomfort. Um, had a little bit of shortness of breath. So, Suda, tell us about some of the challenges you faced, which thought went well, which thought didn't go well. Um, 
I thought I thought we did well with our teamwork. Um, there was a few times where I couldn't think of what we should do right in that moment. Everyone's kind of brainstorming together. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone did a good job of if someone wasn't checking blood pressure or someone wasn't checking a certain thing, someone else jumped in and did it right away. Um, I think the only thing that really tripped me up was I feel like you were looking for something really specific as far as transport. I didn't think about the fact that we could do uh, air. I was just playing it out. Yeah, um, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't even think about air transport at all. It completely um, left my mind. Um, I mean, it's always something to think about if you have a STEMI, because now you have you have a, you have a patient who's specialized, yep. and so it's something now. I mean, you know, it's just an idea. Um, well, the only thing I would have liked to do different is maybe administer a second dose of nitro a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. um, uh, evaluation is why. Think so. Because I don't like to get some credit. Uh, one thing, there's no criticism of the bank control about this stuff. He does. He is a complete total asshole. I, 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 know, I know him. There, there I know him. What do y'all think? Uh, it was. It felt like a real, real life scenario. He's talking to the patient. He's really good that good history. Everyone's uh, their picker. Their picker. Everyone has their own assigned responsibilities. They stuck to it. They were on that the job. Right. Uh, really I think we've proven in this class that the picker thing kind of works. Um, now there is some hiccups in the field as always, but it's something for you guys to think of when you get to the field after you've been out there a while. It's something that you could suggest. Not just pick crew for this, but pick crew for fires, pick crew for entrapments. You know, especially you know, have ass pre-made assignments. I know it, when was it 24, we did that for uh, entrapments, stuff like that, but not every station does. Something for you guys to think about, especially when you got to become officers. It's something to really think about, uh, to go back to maybe revisit this. I agree, I think they'd be great. Good teamwork, everything. I agree. Make control. It sounded pretty good. I don't know what it was important for it. Um, only, only probably thing is uh, we had to ask you know, a couple of times about the IV. It sounded like it was, you, you gave it really good. Yeah, so, I thought he did too. A um, couple of things I have. One, um, what do we administer aspirin, aspirin for in a cardiac chest pain situation? What's the aspirin doing? Preventing coagulation. Exactly. So we're not giving it for pain. Right. Let's go to the nitro first. No, no. I was just saying, you said, let's, when you said, hey, let's go ahead and start some aspirin for this guy to start uh, controlling his pain, I think. Oh, I said, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I just remember that. My second thing is, on your nitro, did you guys remember that you can give 0.4 sublingual up to three doses? In most, in most systems, you can. In yeah. some systems, like here, I, I got to check our protocols again, you can continue past three. Mm -hmm. So, do you have to call medical control? Yeah, I figured you wanted us to call medical that's, control. And that's fine. If that's what you, and that's fine. I have no problem with that in the set. I have no problem with that at all. I just wanted to I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that you can give up to three doses. As long as it's right. So everybody's clear on that. Um did everybody get they did the 12 lead EKG, they printed out um uh, acute STL. Yeah, first time first two times I did because somebody had to say right. And it prints out star, 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 acute ST elevated to my. Um, so that's very valuable information. In this case, um, if we were at Hill, you know, next door to DeKalb Hillendale, I don't want to take that to DeKalb Hillendale. I'd much rather go to Emory. It has a 24 hour cat lab with a cardiologist on standby. So I'd like to bypass the DeKalb Medical over here too. And so, uh, and you, I don't know if anybody ran any STEMIs when you guys were doing third rides, but you probably went to the cat. 
possible yeah. setting. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know why that seems to be such an issue because there is a cath lab STEMI ready facility seven minutes from the cab. It's proven these patients have better outcomes if they can go straight to the cath lab. In Emory's case, Emory University, let's say you get in there to do the cath and you go, I can't get this to open. So the patient needs open heart surgery. Well, you're crap out of luck at the cath medical center. They can't do open heart there. But if you're at Emory, guess what? They're just going to transfer you from the cath lab to the OR. So it's something, you know, that's why those facilities are there. And I don't know why training in the field when it comes to the private EMS units, even when we were to have EMS, it, 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 it got flagged really quick when that happened. It got corrected, but it occasionally happened too. I mean, it should never happen. It should. All right. So even if the patient appears stable, because you have heart, and we're going to talk about that in a second, about the, you know what's going on. Um, so let's talk about that. I'll leave anybody out. I'll cover everybody. Is there any questions in the gallery before we go? Go ahead. Would you ever have someone with chest pain walk? I heard that too, right? I was hoping. I don't think Suda, like, what he didn't want to get gigged on was being in the heat. Right. So he was like, can we just walk over here? I think in a real life situation, knowing Suda, like I know most of y'all now, he's not going to walk him a mile over there, right? He just wanted to show that he understood the general. I, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. Pretty sure you understood the general. Uh, you just wanted the general appearance and wanted to correct that, right? I get either you get it right. I'm clear. So, but no, don't ever walk a cardiac patient. Uh, quick story on my third right. So we got to a guy. He's obviously stored like me, he's high, he had poop on his leg, he gets the pain in the chest. And he had him walk, he could throw a distance all the way to the ambulance, then he went to a 12 week, he was a hospital STEMI. Mm. I think the medic felt like an idiot. They called the STEMI. I'm sure if I was fired. The time? Like, he was walking so long. When we got there, the doctor canceled that. I looked at 12 week. And that's something else, too, guys, when you do become paramedics, there's a price that we pay. For a fault stick, right? It's a little less trust in the field for the next paramedic who calls in a STEMI, and it's the real thing. Why? Because that physician is remembering the last fault stick. And so, and undoubtedly, there's going to be times when you uh, you feel like it's a STEMI and it turns out not to be. But try to limit that, right? It's the same. You can't help but feel that way. It's the same for like a tornado warning. You you, know, you have a tornado warning for your area and you've had four in the last month and you haven't seen a tornado yet. So when the fifth one comes in, what are you going to say? Oh, this, is, this is bullshit. They've said that the last four times and this is going to be the monster when it comes through, right? But <clears throat> you have to, and I say that, you have to continue your education outside of your AEMP, just like you do as a paramedic. You can be an average, below average paramedic if you want to be, but you hurt other people in that process. You have to, I mean, I have to go back and look at these EKGs just to stay up because yeah, I got to remember some stuff. And if I don't use it every day, I look like I kind of do because I work in the hospital, but you have to go back and look. Get it. So, how do we go ahead? Um, so I know, like, we can look at the 12 lead and everything, but we can't really <laughs> interpret it, anyway. right? Uh, but let's say, like, there's not a paramedic unit available, like, then, mm -hmm. but the monitor was interpreted as a STEM. Sure, could we, when we give a report to the hospital, can we say, Hey, the monitor's saying, it's Yeah, you could call a STEMI alert, okay? Yeah, you okay. can call a STEMI alert. This is engine 13 to Emory University. We're waiting on a transport unit. We'd like to uh, declare a STEMI alert this time. So even if you're not permit, so declare Yep, you sure can. Absolutely can. Okay. So how did we get here? How did this guy get here? 
So what's the pathophysiology behind this guy having this MI? What Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. Okay, that's one. That's probably it. That's probably 90% of the MIs, if not more, of the reason why they're having a myocardial infarction. So what is atherosclerosis? Right, it's an occlusion. It's a buildup of plaque that occludes that coronary artery, right? And so what ends up happening is the body's an amazing thing. It has this thing called collateral circulation. It'll actually start building its own little vessel system around that clot, depending on what size it is, since it has time. It takes a while for the body to do this. And it's not quite as effective as its original vessel. Um, but yeah, so that's what happens. Now there's other times when these coronary arteries can spasm. And, and cause restricted blood flow. That'd be the other nine, eight percent of MIs. And where do you think we see that at happening from? Not so much angina, but uh, drug use, okay. cocaine use. Cocaine specifically, amphetamines cause those cardi those coronary arteries to sometimes spasm, and during that spasm. It reduces blood flow to the heart and the the mind. So if we have this, so if this is the case and we don't have blood making it to the heart muscle, okay, so if we have the heart muscles not getting an adequate blood supply, what happens to the tissue of the heart? It's going to die. It's going to die. Exactly. What happens if, though, let's say we have a 50% blockage of that vessel, we're still getting blood flow to it, we're good, and, and the person develops chest discomfort. Um, how is that different from a, from a MI? It's still getting to it, right? Now, do you think the patient could still have chest pain from this or chest discomfort? They can, and that's where your angina's come from, right? And so think about it. If I have angina and I give 50% of blood to the heart, something has to cause that angina, right? Something has to bring it on. So right now, I'm, a, I'm calm, and when we're talking about the heart muscle and its demand for oxygen, right now it's not stressed. It's a normal rate rhythm that I have right now. I'm not doing anything but talking, so therefore it's, it's getting by with a 50% blockage. What's gonna, what do you guys, yeah, what do you guys think is gonna increase that, what could increase that oxygen, oxygen demand? Exercise, physical activity, right? Absolutely can. So if I go walking up the stairs, I go walk up to the fifth floor, or if I do something that increases my heart rate, anytime you increase your heart rate, your muscles, you're increasing that oxygen demand. And so that's where your anginas are going to come from. So You have the different anginas, right? You have stable, unstable, and one more. Starts with a P. Progressive. Yeah, it's on study. Right, progressive. Right, and so let's talk about those. So, a stable angina. How do these come about? Well, let's say I go in, I have some chest pain. It's so on and off. I go in and the cardiologist goes, Mike, let's take you to the cat lab. Let's take a look and see what's going on. And so he goes in and says, well, uh, your, your right coronary artery um, has about a 30% blockage. 
Okay, about 30%. So what we're going to do is we're going to go a less invasive route here. We're going to try to give you some medicine, reduce your cholesterol that causes these plaque buildups. And we're going to do that. And we're going to reevaluate you in about six months. We'll do another cast in about six months, see what it looks like, and go from there. Okay, well, I have a blockage. And it's not a really super bad blockage, but nonetheless, it's a blockage. And so it's pretty consistent in when I have chest pain. If I go up the stairs to the fifth floor, I always get chest pain from it, right? But if I sit down and, or I pop a nitro tab, it goes away until I go back to the fifth floor again. But that can happen with me. It's because I'm anxious going to the fifth floor. I used to be. Not but you know what I mean? So it's a consistent, predictable type chest discomfort. Okay. And that's why my doctor gave me this nitro tab. I said, look, this may happen again while we're treating. If it does, take the nitro. They instruct the patient to take up to three. Okay, cool. So when does this angina change? How, when does it become something different than okay? So yeah, so it gets there when, let's say now I've I did this cast and whatever, and this blockage is just, it's in, it's in high gear. And so I just cannot stop eating pork pounds. And so here I am, my blockage is worse. And now it was, it was kind of predictable if I went to the fifth floor of the stairs, it would hurt. But now if I just walk down to the end of the hall, it starts hurting. Okay, and or now, now just out of the blue from doing something very little activity, it just starts hurting. Okay, so if so, what I'm describing there, those little something, it's kind of progressive. That's a progressive type angina, meaning it's progressively becoming worse. It's not predictable, right? And it may or may not be relieved by nitro or rest. I may be able to uh, relieve it if I rest or whatever, it's progressive. But unstable at this point in time now is right there with it. Unstable means I'm very symptomatic with it. I'm nauseous, I'm diuretic, I can't get this pain to go away. And unstable and acute myocardial infarction you just about, you can't really tell the difference. You really cannot tell the difference. Um, and so I think it's a bad definition. I say it every class that I have. Unstable and AMI, it really shouldn't be an unstable. It should be a stable angina, a progressive and AMI, right? So I think the important part here is just to remember that stable angina is relieved with nitro arrest. Progressive is something different, right? Progressive is you can't predict it. And AMI is just what that is. And that's when we have heart tissue that's dying, right? We don't know that that's the case. We don't have a cast, we can't look. So we have to assume that unstable angina is an acute myocardial infarction until we can prove it otherwise. So that's kind of the the deal with that. You so, said progressive, you can't get treated with medication. Like sometimes you can't, sometimes you can't. Just how, how fast you progressive just kind of fits. Progressive means that it's less predictable than the stable angina, right? The stable angina, I know if I go to the floor, my chest pain. Yeah. But progressive means like if uh, now I can't, it's progressively becoming more yes. severe, okay. right? And I may stop. It may stop when I sit down. If I go walk to the end of the hall and I sit down, it could go, it go away. But progressive is a dangerous sign because progressive could mean that I'm, I'm knocking on the acute myocardial infarction door, right? 
I'm very close to having an AMI. And so that's the kind of stuff you want to listen to your patient. They may say, and I've had this so many times where the patient states, okay, from, this started actually two days ago. All right, I went to work on my car that morning. I was out there working on my car and I started having chest tightness. I came back in the house, I sat down, I was just about to call and it went away. So I thought maybe it was a congestion, you know, something. So I, I you know, said whatever. So last night, I woke up with some chest tightness. Same thing. I got up, you know, and, and I was just about to call it went away. And now today I've called you. It's not stopping. All right. So that, that's usually that's a progressively led. And now we're probably dealing with somebody who's actually in part here. They could have been, they could have had an AMI actually yesterday. Something. But that those are dangerous things to when you hear it, you know. And if they say, "Well, I have a history of anxiety," and they give you the same story, pop the nitro, went away, went to do something else that came back. It don't, normally doesn't come back like that, but it did. And here I am calling you. So those are things to be alert to. There's something else too when we're talking about. The cardiac patient, because they have things that help us to identify them, uh, unlike any other diseases, really. Uh, one, these patients normally have a skin color unlike anyone else. They sometimes will. I can usually spot a STEMI when I look at them, before I lay hands on them. They'll have this grayish appearance to me. It's this gray, I'm sick look about them. Um, you'll see that. Also, their body language is very suggestive. So a lot of times they'll be doing this. Even, even sometimes they'll call you for, and not even tell you it's chest pain. It's whatever, because they don't want it to be chest pain. The mind, is they're scared to death. They probably already know they're having MI sometimes. And they'll be doing this, I don't know really what's wrong. I just don't feel good. And they're going to the chest with their hands or something like that. A lot of times these patients are diaphoretic. They're nauseous. So a lot of times their symptoms are very apparent on the outside. And that that's a good thing that helps us to identify. Um, so that's kind of the path of fizz of how all this goes down. Something good to remember. And so let's just go over the treatment for this. And, when, and then we'll, later we'll talk about some of the other aspects of heart failure, cardiogenic shock. So we saw the treatment in this, right? So what we start off with? Oxygen. A little nasal KO, a couple liters per minute. If you see signs of hypoperfusion, right? You don't want to feel like your patient is anxious and maybe they won't tolerate O2, blow it in their face, but you want to do something to try to help oxygenate, that's fine, okay? As long as they're, this is where the old 94% thing comes into, you know, if they're a little bit below 94, it's okay to go with the cannula, it's fine. All right, so we know that part. And so the second part, somebody said it, over here, aspirin, because it is a what? Anticoagulant, y'all, and we remember what that is, right? Those platelets, they see that plaque, and they all want to jump on top of the plaque. They can't really do anything about it, but they try to, because they see it as an outsider. So they're going to join on top of that. And so just by the luck of the draw, they found out that aspirin is a great thing. Right when they're about to kick aspirin's ass to the door because of rice syndrome and all that. They recommended people don't don't really don't don't take it after so take Tylenol. That's where they were at, and then they did this study. Next thing you know, whoever owns stock and aspirin, boy, you did good. You did good because now we're giving it out for the stuff. So aspirin is a good thing for that. Uh, and the studies were pretty profound of of actual reducing that clot and actually extending people's life. So it was pretty good. All right, so we get the aspirin going. Um, what else do we do? 
Nitro. Nitro. All right. So I don't have to admit, I don't have to mention the contraindications. Y'all, I'm pretty sure y'all all know those. If it, has no it is actually a contraindication, but I, I, I assume, I assume, I, you know, if they're having an asthma attack, don't give them a nitro, maybe. Because I don't know. I don't know why. I still got to find that out. He thought for what? Oh, that's what I was thinking about too, aspirin. I don't know why. As soon as you said asthma, I thought aspirin. That's what they say. I don't know. But nitro, so we know it's definitely contraindicated for your hypotensive patient as well. We know it has, it can make you hypotensive. So if you got somebody riding that 100 systolic border, be ready to treat that in case it happens. All right. And so there is another contraindication of nitro that we haven't really kind of talked about yet. Headaches? No. Mm, probably yeah. head injuries. We haven't talked about ST elevated MIs yet um, and nitro use, right? And it and really what it comes down to is blood pressure. So if we have somebody having an inferior, that's a specific type of, of heart attack, an inferior, right? So inferior relates to what? Bottom. So bottom part of the ventricle, right? An inferior MI with a blood pressure of a, you know, that's, you know, what they're saying is like, well, basically what they want to say, I hate this room so bad, dude. I hate you teaching it. I disagree with it so bad. But basically what they're saying is it's contraindicated in inferior MIs. Now, it all relates to blood pressure. An inferior MI, they tend to react to nitro a little more than any other MI. And so what they want you to do is that stay away from it. Um, I'm not going to test y'all on that. I don't think you'll see it on registry. You'll see it as a paramedic, right? But you won't probably see it as a pain. But nitro, so what What does nitro do? That's pain. What does it do? Yeah, it's a potent vasodilator. Potent. If you look it up, it says potent vasodilator, right? So it's going to dilate those coronary arteries. And that helps, right? Because if I got a 40% blockage, if I make that bigger, that gives me more, maybe a chance for blood to get to that heart muscle. If your patient says, oh, I feel better, right? Then that's a good thing. And it's also something to think about too. Let's say you give somebody a nitro, they go, oh, that feels better. That might be something if you haven't picked up a ST elevated MI yet, that might be a sign that, hey, this might really be cardiac related chest pain. Because if I give a nitro and this patient state, man, that, that did actually help. Then that's the only thing it's going to help with. So it's something for you to, to know. Okay, well, maybe I need to really stay on my piece of cues. This sounds like this is a cardiac emergency. All right, so we got aspirin, we got nitro. What else? IV. And so why do we need an IV? Okay, you need a drug route. Just in case if the patient goes hypertensive. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So if your patient has a response to the nitro, I might not bolus them right away, right? Because this has about a four minute half life. So if I lay them back a little bit, right? Because I gotta be careful about preload. If I increase preload to a heart that already is, you know, may have, doesn't need any more work on it. All right, so we wanna be kind of careful, but Let's say uh, you do that and they have a really big drop in blood pressure. Then yeah, I'm not gonna let them go down below eight systolic. I'm gonna I'm gonna give them a fluid bolus at that time. And 
And I'm not going to give them the big 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus. I'm probably going to give them like a regular just 250 milliliter bolus. 250. All right. Of normal saline. 250 normal saline to get the pressure back up a little bit. So if you do have an inferior MI and they respond heavily to the nitro, you're probably going to find yourself having to do that. So give them the 250 and but I like that. So there's other things in the field where, well, I need an IV established before I get the nitro. You do not. Your blood pressure is good. You do not. Right. Um, you know, we want to open up that coronary artery. Right. Because tissues die. At the end of the day, remember when we first came into this class as an EMT. And I said, cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make organ systems. Our job at the EMS in the pre hospital setting is to save cell death. It's, that is our goal. That's our goal, is to prevent cellular death. So nitroglycerin does that. It prevents cellular death by opening up the artery. Give it as quick as you can. Get your IV after your first one, as long as you have a good blood pressure. Right? You do not. They give people nitro at home to take. They don't pop an IV in their own arm before they take their nitro. So why as medical professionals should we be any different? We're not. So you'll see that in your third ride getting already saw it. Do they check their blood pressure No, they probably don't. They just pop a nitro. Yeah. All right. So we've got we've got O2, we've got aspirin, we've got nitro. What else? Let's go back to EMT school. I think about I already said oxygen. And transport before that. It was one of the only things you guys could do as an EMT. We did, yeah. A blanket. Remember what's happening. All right. What type of metabolism are we dealing with here if we have cells dying? Anaerobic. Anaerobic. What are we producing? Lactic acid. Lactic acid. Right? And so we need to preserve that temperature as much as possible. Right? Now, get common sense, please. Right? It's hot here in Georgia. Okay? We have to cover everybody. But it gets pretty cold in the winter. So if it's end of October, 1st of November, and it's cold, put a blanket on before you take them outside. Right, throw a blanket on. It'll it goes a long ways to keep them warm. Okay, and so we've done. So we've hit O2, we've hit IV, we've hit we've hit aspirin, we've hit nitro. We talked about keeping them warm, and we hit take them to the right facility. So, anybody have any questions on that stuff? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So let's just go forward. You guys know. Who's next and who's doing what? So let's do that. Take a, hang on. Actually, you know, we won't start this now. Take a 15 minute break to 11.15. Come back, work on it to 11.30. Go to lunch. About 10 minutes after returning from lunch, we'll start. Yes, sir. Let's go to Squad Land Four Theater, Squad Five Mike Patrol, Squad Six Riding, Squad One Eva. There you go. Oh, so the cool thing about it is, I would call another engine. I have the engine set up an LG. And so what I would do uh, is find a parking lot with its overhead instructions, right? Uh, have the fire truck there. Some LG also. Line, the way to the fire. I've seen that. Got that with the fire truck. And then that's all you're looking for. And the helicopter pilots are pretty good. Yeah. They, they look and go, hey, I'm suitable LT. If not, they call you on the radio. And you're like, yeah, hey, this, uh, this ain't going to work for us, guys. Can we find somewhere else? So it's table well. I, well, I remember it's been a couple of years ago. At the house, about midnight. And I, I said, damn, there's a damn helicopter. That's like hovering over the damn house. I get up now. It's like I landed in my cul-de-sac because they had a patient who became dramatic. 
And so they landed and paralyzed the patient. Oh, and they took all yes. Yeah. And so they, they landed in the coal sack. I'm like, wow. I called uh, one of the guys that uh, works for Air Memphis, and I know he. I was like, I don't, I don't know if people were working or blah blah blah, but you know, what they landed my damn coal sack for security. He looked it up. Oh yeah, that's what happened. Pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, just great. But yeah, I assume they're used a lot. Yeah, it's outside the, the cab. They're used a lot because they have to get the patient from center or to a you know cardiac facility, and we use them all the time. Right? We fly people out of the ER all the time. I mean, the other day when I worked up, we used them three times. 12 hours. Three times in 12 hours. And so, yeah, we fly all the time from there. Um, so, they get used quite a bit. No, I bet they do. So that's what I was going to say, too. Like, okay, so you've got some Erlanger up there, and their helicopter is different than the one down here. Down here, they can't do a whole lot of patient care in the air. So, Erlanger can't. They got to. Larger helicopter. Um, so also, you know, depends on the size of the helicopter too. So what they can do in the air. It's hard for them and how the patient's position to do stuff like that. they can't do CPR in the air. So if they have cardiac arrest, they have to land or call for as opposed to what's that? Can they not use I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. I don't know that. Um, that's a good question. I'll find out. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they just can't do CPR. Because they don't have room. They have a room to get over the patient. That's the problem. So they might get Can you show me what the stimmy looks like? No, I got things right here. It's not in our book. Yeah, probably not. Um, so, what you're looking for is this is right here. Abnormal ACV, I prefer meat, ST, others, and my That's all you're looking for. So it resonates. It does. Oh, okay. So we're not trying to. You're not trying to read it. Right. You're not supposed to. Okay. So yeah, we'll have that. So it's just going to understand. Yep. Okay. I was trying to use this little. Yeah. See if we can. Well, that's what's not. But I was wondering how they were recognizing it. Because we couldn't see it. Yeah, that's it. So, so it's out. So it's ST elevation. And that is indicated. That's active and not. That's active and not. Yeah, okay. That's all. Two quick questions. So, Cole, if I get on the real quick, topping some more stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 
Does it? <laughs> set it off in that direction. It sets it off the way the scene says. And I think that's the side of the right. So why the brain controls that? Your brain controls, like, you know when you're hungry, right? You know when you want to, like, drink. No, that is a physical A male and a female are physical beings. No, Yeah. Yeah. You can't say most. You can't say most. Yeah. 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 Ye
Oh, 
Thank you all work so okay.
Thank you.
analysis. So my kid crushed through those. Yeah.